Welcome to Medical Murmurs, Medical Student Edition, where emergency physician Dr. Paris Lovett talks with other doctors about their specialty, and we focus on career questions such as what their professional life is like and how best to get into a specialty and develop a career. If you haven't already, we suggest that you first listen to the main Medical Murmurs podcast featuring the same guest before you listen to this one. We're going to resume the interview with Dr. Block with him talking about getting into the competitive specialty of otolaryngology. If someone wants to go into ENT, uh, what do you recommend they do to maximize their chances? Obviously, scores, grades, hugely important. Um, and it's gotten more competitive. Like when I see some of the board scores today, I didn't, I, it looks like almost as if they changed the scale, right? Like, Something in the 240s I thought was unheard of, and yet it seems like people are routinely getting 260s. I didn't think it went up to that high, <laughs> uh, but that, that's the type of stuff that we're hearing. You know, keep, keep in mind, you know, I was, I was involved in some of the selection process when I was a resident because they do involve the residents a little bit. Um, but I'm in private practice now. And again, I, I graduated in 2011. So I'm, I'm far away from the process. So I, I don't want to give too much information. You had a, a viewpoint from when you're a resident and you also were an applicant yourself. So uh, just interested in, you know, what did you do to maximize your chances and, and what would you recommend for others? Yeah. So the research was important, right? They, they want to know that you're Really, they want to know that you're going to contribute to the advancement of the field. That's what it comes down to. I mean, it, it seems like a game, and it is a game, right? It's kind of like dating, right? If you seem desperate, desperation is unattractive. Uh, so don't seem desperate. You got to you got to play the game, and the research is part of the game. Um, but the reason that they want to see the research is because they want to know you're taking it seriously, and they also want to know that you're going to contribute to the advancement of the field, because this stuff doesn't occur in a vacuum, right? Like new procedures, new medications, new breakthroughs. Someone's got to be doing this research, and and they want to know that you're going to be interested in, in doing that type of thing. So you know it's important to have research, and like I said, it's a small field. We graduate something like 260 residents a year. There are not that many of us out there, and you know, and people know each other. And so it's important that you identify a, a mentor, someone that you will be able to work with, someone that, and make sure that re, that mentor is receptive. Because it seems like, if it seems like they're not interested, it's because they're not interested. Don't, you know, don't beat a dead horse. Find someone different. Find someone that will be able to, to mentor them. But it, it does help if they, if this individual does have some prominence on the national stage, because that means they're connected. Right. That means if they write a letter, they're going to be writing a letter to someone that they did residency with to be like, hey, Donna, I haven't seen you in a while. How you doing? How are the kids? By the way, I worked with this kid and she's a great uh, medical student. I think she'd make a great resident. Right. Is, is very different from like someone who you don't know wrote you a letter and said very flowery things about the person that they know. Right. So, so, so who, you know, is, is important. You know, like I said, it's unfortunate that it's a game. It is the game. Don't hate the player, hate the game, learn the rules and, uh, and you'll excel at it. Um, so that there's research. And then the other thing is away rotations. I ended up matching at Georgetown where I did an away rotation. And I'm still to this day convinced that I matched there, not because I was a stellar medical student, on the rounds, I think I was probably in the middle somewhere, right? Then why did they take me? Well, at the end of the rotation, we did a grand rounds. We did, we did a presentation and I killed it. I absolutely killed it. I worked my ass off that month on that, uh, on, on being a good resident and, you know, reading for my cases and all that stuff that I was supposed to do. But that wasn't the thing that ended up setting me apart. The thing that set me apart was I did a grand rounds that all the attendings went to and I just destroyed it. Um, God, what was it? It was it was medullary thyroid cancer um, in uh, MEN2B. So multiple endocrine neoplasia 2B um, has a 100% penetrance of medullary thyroid cancer. 
So if you know that someone with this gene is going to develop medullary thyroid cancer, shouldn't you take out their thyroid? Yes. Okay. When? And I tried to answer that question. And there wasn't an answer to that question. But I just got everything that I could together to try to answer the question of when do you take it out? And then, you know, this was a question that I'm sure these academics, you know, the head and neck cancer specialist, the pediatric specialist, they they would see maybe once every few years. And now they have the best answer they can to that question delivered to them by a medical student. So, you know, that that was the, th- you know, the, the reason that I remember that now. God, I finished residency eight and a half years ago. So that rotation was then four more years on top of that. So that was a while ago. And yet I still remember that presentation. Um, and and I think that was the thing that that got me in. Talk to me a little bit about what a typical day is like for you when you're clinical. So I do surgery half a day a week, um, sometimes two half days a week. Uh, but the rest of the time I'm in the office and, you know, I see about 30 patients a day, uh, maybe a little, you know, maybe between 25 and 30 patients a day. Um, and you know, those, those patients that I, that I've been describing that come in with sinus complaints, real, you know, sinus infections or sinus pressure, nasal obstruction, nasal polyps, um, and they come in with, uh, you know, of all, all, all shapes and sizes. Sleep apnea I haven't talked about. I treat a lot of sleep apnea. Um, uh, voice disorders, swallowing disorders, earwax, a lot of earwax. And, uh, and then some of the things that are, that are tougher to figure out, right? Patient comes in with earfulness, thinks they've got hearing loss. Check their hearing. Normal exam. Yet, you know, like this patient that ended up having many years, a lot of times it doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't come to a head and they've just got this, this symptom or something like throat clearing and a globus sensation. Globus is the sensation that they have uh, something stuck in their throat. And the old term for globus that we don't use anymore, the globus hystericus. The reason it's globus hystericus is because you look down your th- their throat and you don't see anything. So you got to figure out what's causing them to feel like there's something stuck in their throat and it can be reflux. There can actually be something down there. You know, there could be, there could be a tumor down there. You know, you have to take these complaints very seriously. Um, it, It can be, I've seen Sjogren's syndrome present this way where they just feel like there's something stuck in their throat. Why? Well, it's their mucus. Their mucus is so viscous because their mouth is so dry that they they have const- they do have constantly have mucus in their throat and the, and it gives them the, a lump sensation and the, the need to constantly throat clear. Um so so something like that uh, you know something as simple as throat clearing sometimes it's habitual can have so many different uh, diagnoses and that you know that's what we treat. So I'll see one patient, I'll see uh you know I'll take out I'll they'll come in with some hearing loss, take a look in their ears, they've got tons of earwax, take it out. They leave feeling fantastic, like I'm some kind of a genius. Um, And then I'll go see the next patient who has a complaint of chronic nasal obstruction. Maybe it's on one side, maybe it's on both sides. Spray their nose with a a mix of Afrin and lidocaine. Leave them for a couple minutes. Go see the next patient across the hall. Talk to them about what they're doing. Maybe they've been snoring and we've got to work them up for sleep apnea. Then go back across the hall to the patient I I sprayed. Look up their nose with with a camera to try and figure out whether it's polyps or sinus infection or adenoids or what's going on that's not allowing them to to breathe, come up with the, the plan for what medications we're going to use, go over the potential side effects of those medications, make sure there are no interactions with their medications, make sure they understand the plan, make sure they're satisfied with the plan, then go to the next patient across the hall who um, is presenting with dizziness and they're not sure how long it's going for, we're going on for, or it's, you know, they're having trouble quantifying it and, um, you know, they're in with, with someone who is actually translating for them, which is making the it, it even more difficult and they're having trouble. So then we get the translator phone and, and then, you know, we're spending a lot of time with that patient trying to figure out exactly what they mean by dizzy. Cause it's enough so many different 
it means so many different things. And at this point now I'm half an hour behind and my patients are waiting and they're angry because they made their appointments um, and they did, they showed up on time and maybe they showed up even a little early. So they've been waiting a little longer and that's kind of stressing me out because I don't like it when my patients have to wait. And so then finally I finish what's going on with this dizzy patient and their workup and make sure they understand what their differential diagnosis is and what their workup is going to be. And then I'll go on to the next patient who you get the idea. That's my day. You are listening to Medical Murmurs, Medical Student Edition. If you enjoy this podcast, don't forget to review us on iTunes and other forums. You can also visit medicalmurmurs.com and sign up to hear about new episodes. Is there a kind of person you think is going to do well going into your specialty and others that may not do so well? No, I'm no, I don't know. I don't know. I really I don't I don't know how to answer that cuz Cause, cause you know, the, the, the specialty is so, is so varied, right? Like if you love the operating room, then you're going to become a head and neck oncologist so that you're in the operating room most of the time. If you love endoscopy, right, then you're, can, you can become a sinus surgeon or, or a laryngologist who does voice and swallowing. They do a lot of vocal cord surgery, they do a lot of procedures. If you love kids, right, then you be, you do a fellowship in peds. If you're, you're like me. You love it all, but those uber, uber complicated surgeries aren't really your thing. You become a generalist and you, you know, you do, you do, you do everything except for those, those types of cases. Um, I wonder if that's why, you know, they've done surveys on the specialties and apparently otolaryngology is the specialty with the highest degree of happiness among physicians. Had you heard that before? No, I wasn't, I wasn't aware. I know we're pretty happy. Um, and, you know, even as residents, we tend to be, you know, there, there are different stereotypes for different, uh, different fields. And I think we're kind of like, like hipster nerds, kind of like, you know, that's, that's how people think of it. Cause we're like, we're not too hardcore. We're not like orthopedic surgeons banging around big instruments and hammers and nails or or general surgeons who have chests and bellies open all the time we're like you know we do a little of this and a little of that we do some surgeries and you know get our hands dirty something that people will argue for not like we need more applicants in otolaryngology but i'm still going to make a case for it uh that, that people will say that you only get in say family medicine you know you get to keep you get to see the kid from um you know, from birth till death, you get to see the patient from birth till death, right? Um, I'm sure they have a way, a very more eloquent way of saying it, but uh, but we see that in otolaryngology too. I have families where I take care of three generations of the same family. So, you know, we because we see such varied ages, it's one of the few specialties where you, where you see that. And we also have continuity of care. You, know, you think of surgical specialties and not having continuity of care. That's not true at all. I mean, I don't know much about urology, but I would imagine if you have a propensity to form stones, you have a propensity to form stones. You are going to have a close relationship with your with your urologist. And for me, I think if you have sinus problems, you have sinus problems. If you have middle ear problems as a kid, you know, you might have asthma as well, which means you might have sinus problems as well. And you might be a patient of mine for a very long time. I, you know, we see we, there there is a lot of continuity of care in our field. And sometimes people will be a, of the... Um, misconception that that you only get that in in a primary care field where you get you get to establish long-term relationships with your patients i definitely have long-term relationships with my patients sometimes again eight and a half years out sometimes it's still remarkable to me that like I've, wow i've been seeing you for seven years and the variety of what we treat you know we can treat a four-day-old for tongue tie maybe a one-month-old from learning or malaysia and maybe a 90-year-old who's having dizziness or swallowing difficulties. So the, the age range is huge. The pathology is very different. And then once you decide that you want to go into ENT, something I didn't realize but now do, is the type of practice that you can have varies really widely. You can be in private practice like I am and see all of those different varieties of, of problems. Or you can go into academics and become a super specialist and just do sinus problems or just do head and neck cancer or just do voice and swallowing. Um, and then if you're at the academic center versus the community, the type of the complexity of the stuff that you see is very different. So if you want to see that those uber complicated patients, then, you know, 
you're at an academic center. So, you know, the the one thing that that I think medical students don't realize is that, you know, when, when you've chosen your specialty, the variety of practice within that specialty can still be huge. The other thing that I didn't realize is how different my life would be from that of a resident. Now I know work hours are very different, responsibilities are very different, but that like the type of pathology that I see as as a generalist out in the community is very different from the stuff that I was seeing in the uh, in the academic center at, at Georgetown and Washington Hospital Center. Medical Murmurs, Medical Student Edition. I do have one thing I wanted to uh, to ask you before we wrap up, which is how do you think you look back on your almost 10 years since uh, finishing your training? How do you think the specialty has changed in that time? I think we're doing more in the office. I think we're learning from the dentists and the oral surgeons, and we're getting at least, at least, from where I'm looking, we're taking more out of the operating room and bringing it back into the office. And when I say back into the office, they used to do tonsillectomies awake. So there was a lot more done in the office, you know, many years ago than, than, than there is now. And we're seeing a shift back. Um, you know, we're ballooning people's sinuses open. That's a story for a different day. I am not a big fan of the balloon. Um, but that's just an example of it. Um, there are other procedures, sinus procedures, nasal procedures. There are people that are doing sinus limited sinus surgeries in the office, big polypectomies that were limited into the, um, to the operating room before now being done in the office. So we're, we're taking their, their, you know, their laser procedures. People have lasers in their office, few and far between. Uh, but, we're doing more like laser vocal cord surgery in the office and not in the operating room. One of my, one of my partners has one. Um, so, so I think that's one shift is that we're moving out of the, we're doing more office based procedures and less surgeries. Um, and a, another shift is, is cancer. Um, the, as, Fewer and fewer people are smoking. We're seeing less smoking-related head and neck cancer. Well, what's that being replaced by? That's being replaced by HPV head and neck cancer. So we're seeing a rise in lingual tonsil cancer and ton and palatine tonsil cancer from HPV. Now, thankfully, it's more susceptible to radiation than the smoking-related cancers, but we're seeing we're seeing more of it. And the Gardasil vaccine is not as widely used as we'd like it to be. So uh, those are, those are some two, those are, that's another change in just this, this change of who's even getting the cancer to begin with. This is Medical Murmurs, Medical Student Edition. This podcast was focused on career issues of particular interest to medical students and prospective medical students. We suggest you also listen to the main Medical Murmurs episode featuring the same guests discussing a wider range of issues and sharing stories for a more general audience. Check it out. You have been listening to my interview with Dr. Bradley Block, an otolaryngologist based in New York, and also the creator and host of the podcast called The Physician's Guide to Doctoring.